I'm very glad that Jason brought up sort of this morals and ethics. And so I think just to kind of maybe give people a chance to kind of respond on that and bring that, because a lot of times people in divestment uh, think of like the monetary, like what, it, what happens, you know, they think of investment. Um, and we've talked a lot about like the theory of, of change. Um, and recently President Reif wrote an op-ed piece where he wants, quote, MIT to be famous not only for its scientific and technical achievements, but also for how we treat people. And that, quote, MIT should strive to make our community one where all of us instinctively operate with the highest integrity and ethics too. As an institution, MIT has a notable history of taking the high road and we must teach our students and remind each other why that is important and how it is done. So maybe we could have some of the other panelists um, answer this question about how MIT's investment practices should be factored into a discussion on, on morals and ethics um, at MIT, and if so, how, or if not, why not? And then we'll open it to uh, the audience for questions. So what's the date of that statement? Is that recent? It's, like it's a fairly week, recent, week a couple weeks ago. Week yeah, so that's yeah. a gift, right? Uh -huh. You yes. guys can just go to town with that, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, enough said. I mean, it, it, Harvard has this, you know, they have the shield that says Veritas, right? So truth, handy for, they, they've turned that shield into divestment. I did a little research to try to find ethics and morals in MIT's bylaws. I actually couldn't find any, but I know there's something there. Um, but, it, you know, beyond that, there is another Ivy League in institution that went through its trustee bylaws, and it found the kind of language that actually that letter reflects. And they used that just to build a legal argument before the Board of Trustees that said, uh, going to Jason's very valid point about, hey, this is misalignment. Okay, this is what we said we're about, and this doesn't line up. So, you know, a good lawyer did that, and that particular school actually was attempting to simply divest of coal, further to Jason's point, which is just, you know, not to get tactical here. Um, but I can't imagine anything better than that letter with that individual and this date for you to just, you know, there, there's your, your campaign right there. I think this is necessarily a moral question. Uh, the, I, I simply, and I've worked doing climate modeling for a long time, but the idea that there's a magic, sharp, scientific answer, and that answer dictates what we do, is nonsense. It's sweeping all the hard problems under the rug. The, there is no magic two-degree threshold. I know of no climate scientist who truly believes that. This is a constructed thing that climate scientists, and I know a lot of them who did it, thought was useful for political action, and it may or may not be useful for political action. Uh, there's no question that the more CO2 you put in the air, you more, the more you raise the risk of climate change. No question about that at all. But the idea that there's some magic threshold where like 1.9 degrees is fine and 2.1 is bad, not supported by any science. And, and I think it, it, it's really crucial to see how important morality is in this game. This is about us not using our clean energy, our, our cheap energy, to pass on risk to our great grandkids. It's very hard to see that in anything but moral terms. This is very different from other environmental problems where you can more simply see it as self-interest. So it's also true that air pollution kills, you know, still 50,000 people or so a year, premature mortality in this country. And you can have direct self-interest arguments to generations now living, us, why we ought to clean up. But that argument is quite different for climate change. Because of the very long time constants of carbon in the system, uh, the, the fundamental argument, I think the only argument that really makes sense is one that inevitably involves morality, which is, you know, how we think about the value of future generations and of having the natural world more like it is. And, and I think the idea that you can abstract that away and say you just have this magic piece of science, uh, y y you know, it violates the thing you get in Philosophy 101. You just don't go from fact to values like that. And I think it's one of the great things about this movement is that people are becoming more clear-eyed about speaking frankly about the moral questions involved. 